Good day, students. This is Mr. Reynolds, and I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about stars. Uh, we have a two-part lesson today. Uh, this first part is going to be sort of heavy, a lot of stuff in it, very important stuff to be paying attention to now. Uh, the second part is going to focus on the lifespan of stars. How do stars live, how do they die, and what happens when they die? Let's just get started on what a star is. So a star is essentially a big ball of gas. If you look at our sun, uh, the sun is mostly a ga big ball of hydrogen, helium, and a couple other things. Now, you could get a hydrogen balloon in your classroom and, and look at it, but it, it probably wouldn't become a star. So the difference between a big hydrogen balloon or helium balloon or whatever and the big glowy thing in the sky is that the sun has a whole bunch of hydrogen, has a whole lot of hydrogen. So here's our sun. It's a big blue sun for some reason. And uh, when you get a big bunch of mass together, all that mass starts pulling on each other. And in the center of the sun, you get what's called the core. The core has huge amounts of uh, gravitational pressure all pushing in on it. Gravity is just trying to collapse all those gases into the core. Now, um, in a sun, you get a situation where that hydrogen, that hydrogen inside the core, the most basic element we can get, is being squeezed together with such an extent that the hydrogen starts joining with other hydrogens and creating helium. Okay, we're not going to go into a huge amount of detail behind this. Uh, we'll get into that later in the nuclear chapter. But for now, we can just say that hydrogen plus hydrogen yields helium. This is a process called nuclear fusion. This is not what happens at the nuclear plant down the road. That's fission with uranium, big things. This is uh, fusion with small things. Now, when hydrogen joins to form helium, another thing is created, and that is some energy. That energy provides a counter force pushing out, we sometimes call it the radiation pressure, pushing out, keeping the star at a constant radius. Otherwise, the gravity would just cause everything to collapse. And so the star has a core. Now, fusion really is only going on in the core. It's not going on in the outer layers. It's not going on all in through here and here and here and here because there just isn't enough gravitational force to cause that fusion to start. If you're a hydrogen atom sitting on the surface of the sun out here, you're not going to undergo fusion. You've got to be in the core. And really what tends to happen is the hydrogen and helium and whatever inside the core and the stuff outside side of the core, they really don't mix very much. They mainly stay in place. We're going to talk about that more in the second video, about what happens when you start running out of hydrogen. Now, this core gives off energy. That energy travels, whoops, uh, that energy travels out from the core and eventually hits the surface and then flies away from the surface. Now, a, a star does not give off only one wavelength of light. A star gives off all different kinds of wavelengths of light. You know, obviously the star gives off visible light, wavelengths 400 to 700 nanometers, but a star also gives off infrared. I know that when I go out uh, away from the shade, I feel warmer. When I get inside the shade, I feel cooler. Well, that's not a change of temperature of the air. It's the same air in the shade and out of the shade. Uh, but what's happening is you're blocking infrared waves, another type away from the sun. Um, also, the sun, is, as you may find out during the summer, it gives off ultraviolet waves. That's why you get sunburn. So the sun gives off all kinds of waves, all different wavelengths. And knowing what wavelengths the sun gives off is actually pretty important. What I have here is a simulation from FET. And, and this simulation is simulating uh, the, all the waves, what we sometimes call the stellar spectra, the spectrum of wavelengths given off by the sun. Now, don't worry about the y-axis so much. Just, just think about that in terms of how many, you know, how, how, how powerful, how the intensity of those waves. It's not exactly intensity, but close enough for the government to work. And so if you look at this image, and I can't point, unfortunately, because uh, this is the app, but you can see that um, if I zoom in a little bit, uh, 
we can see that those wavelengths of light that have the most intensity from the sun are focused right in that visible light range, about from 400 to 700 or so nanometers. And in fact, the peak, the peak, and I think I can label that, yeah, that little white dot there, the peak wavelength is right around 500 nanometers. And so that's like a, a greenish, tealish color. And so that raises the question, well, what color is the sun? Is the sun green? I mean, I, you know, it's been sort of a cloudy day today. I didn't really look at the sun today, but it didn't appear to be green. And in fact, in this uh, simulation, they show us the color of the sun, and it's really a whitish type of color. Because while green is certainly my peak wavelength, there's a bunch of reds, and there's a bunch of blues and violets, and all those wavelengths add up together to form the white star that you see in the sky. Uh, we can also see that if you have bigger wavelengths, of course, you're infrared waves. Smaller wavelengths, you are ultraviolet waves. Now, this spectrum is very important to us because watch what happens as I lower the temperature of the star. If I lower the temperature of the star, two main changes are happening. The first change is that the peak wavelength the, the wavelength with the maximum intensity is actually increasing. It started at 500 nanometers and it's increased all the way out to just about 600 nanometers. So as I lower the temperature, the peak wavelength increases. If I raise the temperature, the peak wavelength gets smaller. Notice that star becoming more and more blue as the peak wavelength uh, gets, as the temperature gets smaller, like maybe to the temperature of a light bulb, the peak wavelength gets bigger and bigger, more reddish and orangish. Right? So by changing the temperature, we can change the peak wavelength. That's a very important tool for scientists. The other thing that happens is that the spectral power density, just think of it like intensity, uh, decreases. Less temperature, less intensity from the star. You certainly saw that with our luminosity equations in the last chapter. So know the shape of this graph. You do need to know the shape of the graph. It is a pretty constant shape. Notice how it starts at the beginning, shoots up pretty high, and then sort of fades off almost exponentially like. You won't have to drive the equation for that whole thing, but you will need to know the general shape. You also need to know what happens when the temperature changes. If the temperature goes down, that peak goes down to the right. If the temperature goes up, it goes up to the left. Right? By the way, uh, if I lower the temperature down to the temperature of Earth, um, let's say about 300 Kelvin, well, certainly we're not giving off visible light anymore, but now we're at the point, zoom in quite a bit, and zoom out a little bit here. Um, I always mess up. So this is basically what's happening with your body right now. Your body is about 311 Kelvin, depending on whether you have the coronavirus or not. And so your body is actually giving off waves just like the sun does. Only the waves you give off are infrared waves. This is one of the reasons a blanket makes you feel warm. You, know, you give off heat. You know? So if the predator is after you, you've got to watch out for that because they can see heat. Notice visible light. You don't tend to give off visible light. Now, if you live closer to a nuclear plant, that may change. But typically, uh, you don't glow, no matter what that guy or girl that's trying to seduce you may say. So, this is called black body radiation. Black body, we're going to talk more about that uh, next year when we talk about uh, environmental stuff. But this is a nice little graph, a nice little simulation of black body radiation. Notice how if I lower the temperature, the peak... Uh, wavelength goes to the right and the temperature goes down. Now this is something we can actually do. We, can, we actually have an equation for that peak wavelength. Uh, we have an equation for the peak wavelength that says lambda max multiplied by temperature equals 2.9 times 10 to the negative third meter Kelvin. Now temperature here uh, with any astrophysics stuff, whenever you have temperature by itself anyway, temperature does have to be in Kelvin. And that won't be an issue in this chapter. Um, you will always have temperatures in Kelvin, not an issue. Uh, but what this equation does is it lets you calculate the peak wavelength. So if I take, for example, uh, 2.9 times 10 to the negative third meter Kelvin, 
divided by the temperature of our sun. The temperature of the surface of the sun, by the way, that's the surface, not the core, is about 5,800 Kelvin. And if you do that math, it actually works out pretty nice. And we find the peak wavelength is 500 nanometers, smack dab in the middle of our visible range. So that's great. So we can use the temperature to find the peak wavelength. But if you're an astrophysicist, you probably don't have a really long thermometer to measure the temperature of a star. In fact, what you might be doing is something, uh, something like this, where you are actually looking at a star. So this would be an example of a stellar spectrum. Um, and you, basically what you're going to do is you're going to calculate the intensity of light, again, not really, but go with me here, uh, at every specific wavelength. Notice on the x-axis here we have wavelength in angstroms, which is a weird unit, don't worry about it. It just means times 10 to the negative 10th. Uh, so 8,000 angstroms is 800 nanometers. So just imagine there's a little decimal point there. You can see the same basic shape we normally see. You can see that same black body shape we just saw. And so what scientists can do is they can find, hey, where is that peak wavelength coming to? They can come down here and use that peak wavelength, plug it into the equation to find uh, the temperature, and we can know the temperature of a star without even touching it. Very cool. Don't forget about this equation for peak wavelength. If they're ever asking about a wavelength from a star, you're going to be using that equation, uh, no doubt. Now, you'll notice this graph is not as pretty as uh, the, um, the simulation. You see these dips here. You see these dips. Well, here's what happens. Um, we like to think of a star as just a big bottle of hydrogen, but it's not. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff in the outer layers of that star. And, you know, there's elements in space. There's some oxygen hanging around, maybe some sodium, maybe some magnesium, all, all kinds of stuff. Now, these elements, what they will tend to do is when you get a certain wavelength of light, there may be a certain wavelength of light that that oxygen is going to see that wavelength of light and it's going to maybe absorb it. It's going to absorb the wavelength and then shoot it out in a new direction. Now what that means for us, if, if that oxygen inside the outer layers of the star has stolen one of those particular wavelengths of light and sent it off in another direction, that means we don't see it means we don't see that particular wavelength. We're going to talk much later about uh, electron energy levels while she calculates some of these, uh, you know, what wavelength would the, 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 uh, the wave have to be to be absorbed by hydrogen, for example. But, um, but what happens is at very specific wavelengths, like here, 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 all over the place, you get specific elements absorbing some of that light. We call them absorption lines. One very important one is at about 656 nanometers. You don't need to know that number for a test or anything, but it's called the hydrogen alpha line. And it's a very important tool we're going to talk about later when we talk about blue shift and red shift and how scientists use that. But we know that this wavelength, this little dip right here, shows up at the same wavelength for all stars. I'll leave it there. Some of you have read ahead, know a little bit about Doppler effect, know where I'm going to go with this. But, um, but these, are, these are what the absorption lines are. The presence of these lines indicate what kind of elements are in that star. If a star is running out of hydrogen, if it's, uh, you know, if it's a very, um, you know, depending on the temperature, there's a lot of things that could happen. You might not see some of these lines. You might see other lines. And scientists can actually learn a lot from this type of graph. This is an actual solar spectrum for a certain graph. If you've got a telescope, plug in these coordinates and you can actually see the star. I have no idea what star it is, but... You can check it out. We would have done a lab where we pull up a couple of these spectrums and done a little sort of inquiry activity where we sort of figure some stuff out about them. But um, unfortunately, that's not something we're going to be able to do. Thank you, coronavirus. So stars, big balls of gas. We can calculate their temperature. We know there's other stuff out there in them. We'll talk about some of this stuff and how we can use that in a future class.
Now, a big takeaway from today is going to be how do we categorize stars? Because stars, you have young stars and old stars. You have big stars and small stars. And so what scientists did is they took information about as many stars as they could, and they tried to figure out a way of organizing them in a way that made sense. And this is what they came up with. And again, this is something we would have done a more... Um, uh, more inquiry type of activity. Uh, unfortunately, you know, it's we're just gonna I'm just gonna start out to tell you what this is. This is what's called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. We're going to highlight that right there. Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. You'll refer. You'll see it as the HR diagram. In May 2021, when you take your IB test, you will see a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram on paper three. I can pretty much guarantee it. This is a diagram of all the stars that we can see. Now, we certainly can't see them all, but this is a good representation of as many stars as we can get our hands on. Now, the axes sometimes change a little bit, but these are the typical axes we'll be dealing with. On the x-axis, we have temperature. Now, two things I want to pay attention to on the x-axis. First, actually, tell you what, look at the x-axis. Tell me if you can figure out what are the important things about the x-axis. First thing, look at the values. Hot is on the left, cold is on the right. The temperatures go from hot to cold. This is sort of backwards. Normally you'd think the low temperatures are on the left, maybe zero zeros at the origin. Not the case. Uh, we go from hot to cold. Another thing to pay attention to, this is not a linear scale. This is what's called a logarithmic scale. Okay, so if this interval is 15,000 and this interval is 3,000, that wouldn't make a lot of sense. We use, when doing stars and these scales, we always use a logarithmic scale. What that allows us to do is get a lot more detail in the lower numbers. If this was just a graph from 25,000 to zero, pretty much all the stars would just be shoved over in the corner. We couldn't see a thing. And so we use a logarithmic scale. Don't let that throw you off too much, but that is the way we do it. We also have classes of stars. Okay, the, oh, that was a horrible highlighter. Here we go, classes of stars. You don't need to know huge detail about these, but you do need to remember the order of the classes. They go by temperature, from hot to cold, and the way to remember it is with this phrase. Oh boy, an F's gonna kill me. Imagine you brought an F home on a report card. You're thinking, oh boy, an F's going to kill me. O-B-A-F-G-K-M. O-B-A-F-G-K-M. Those are the order of the stars. An O star is a blazing hot star. An M star is a, you know, pretty cold star. Okay? O-B-A-F-G-K-M. These are the classes of stars. Right? Um, by the way, the sun, in case you're wondering, is a G-type star. Um, and it's, uh, th there are further classifications, but we don't need to worry too much about those. It, but the sun is a G. The sun is a pretty normal, boring star, to be honest. The y-axis. The y-axis, we have luminosity. Remember what luminosity is? It's the fancy astrophysicist term for power. It's the amount of energy a star gives out every second. As you can imagine, that's a lot of energy. Amount of energy in one second, that's a lot. And so you might see a graph with the actual luminosities, but it's very rare. In this case, and usually this is the case, we will measure luminosity using solar luminosities. Okay? L and a circle with a dot in it. That's a symbol for the sun. So one solar luminosity, well, that's uh, actually the luminosity of the sun. Notice where that hits this area right here. Here's where our sun's hanging out. Okay? Again, we have a logarithmic scale. Here's 100 solar luminosities, 10,000 solar luminosities, and a million solar luminosities. The reason we need that log scale is because if we graph from zero to a million, then all, basically all the stars at the very, very top, 
you wouldn't see them. They would all be on this bottom axis. It would be a completely useless graph. So just pay attention to the fact this is a logarithmic scale. Halfway between 100 and 10,000 is not what 5,050. Okay, 5,050 is going to be somewhere up here. All right, so don't worry too much about that. If you need to precisely measure, you'll be given a scale. Just pay attention to that scale. So this is a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And as you see, these are where all the stars are. And we're going to be talking about this a little bit more as we go forward. I'm going to go to a, a clean version of the Hertzsprung-Russell. We haven't uh, marked up as much. Let me pull this over here. Let's talk about the major classes of stars and what they do and what they are. So uh, first, let's talk about, uh, we use this purple area here. This is the main sequence. So this pinkish color, pink is main sequence stars. I guess I don't need to write it down. You can see it right there. The main sequence stars are your bread and butter stars. These are where the stars are in their normal lifetime. When they're born, they go to the main sequence. They hang out there until they really start to die. Okay, so uh, if, if you're on the main sequence, you're burning hydrogen, you're doing just fine, you're hanging out. Now, you might be bigger, you might be smaller. Okay, so the bigger stars, bigger stars are going to be somewhere up here. Remember our luminosity equation? L equals Stefan Boltzmann's AT to the fourth. If you need to think about... Um, uh, you know, how, how that's going to work out. Well, you know, A is 4 pi r squared. So let's say you have two stars, uh, star A and star B. They're both at the same luminosities, but B, uh, sorry, the same temperatures, but A has a higher luminosity. Higher luminosity, same temperature, your radius must be bigger. So these are big, big stars in the top left, very, very small stars in the bottom right. Um, here's our main sequence. The sun is a member of the main sequence. The sun is middle-aged. It has uh, plenty of hydrogen, about 4 billion years worth. It is burning away just fat and happy. No problem on the main sequence. This is where stars spend the most of their lives. Uh, once, uh, once they start to die... We'll talk more about this in a future video, but uh, you may go to the giants, or depending on how big you are, potentially out to the super giants. Typically, we'll just classify these as one type of star. We'll just call them the giants, and in fact, we'll call these the red giants most often. Uh, typically, we call them the red giants because they are on the colder end of the temperature spectrum, and so they look red. And so typically when a star, for example, our sun, it will become a red giant. It's going to hang out in the giant, red giant category. So here's your red giants. Another important category are the white dwarfs. Now, white dwarfs, they're hot and they're small. White dwarfs, hot and small. Uh, they're hanging out down here. White dwarf is the core of a star that has uh, died, essentially our sun will become a white dwarf. We're going to talk about how in the next video. Most of these stars are relatively small, medium-sized stars. When they die, they're just going to blow their outer layers away, leave a nebula, and what's left is the core of the star. The core of the star is the white dwarf. Typically, they hang out there, cooling slowly over millions and billions of years. But these are the general areas of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. You have the giants, the main sequence, and the white dwarfs. Make sure you can identify where those places are. Now, with the main sequence, we do have an interesting thing, the thing that happens. This is called the mass luminosity relationship. for main sequence stars. Now, the key here is these are for main sequence stars. In a problem, if a problem on a worksheet or whatever is going into explicit detail, saying star A, B, X, Y, Z, whatever, that these stars are main sequence stars, you want to be thinking about this equation. This is the mass 
luminosity relationship for main sequence stars. And this is a fairly uh, straightforward relationship. I'll show you how it's used here in just a second. So only for main sequence, can't be used for anything else. Luminosity is proportional to mass to the 3.5th power. You may say, Mr. Reynolds, how is that useful? Well, let me show you how it's useful. Whenever you see a proportional symbol, you're almost always going to be using some sort of a ratio. What proportional means is it means luminosity is equal to some constant called K times mass to the 3.5th power. So if I do, let's say, L over M to 3.5, it's going to equal a constant. And for all main sequence stars, that constant is constant. It is the same. And so what I could do is find the luminosity and mass for star A and set it equal to luminosity and mass for star B as long as those two stars are both main sequence stars. So for example, let's say the uh, um, mass of A is 10 times the mass of B. A is 10 times, well, that's, that's a big number. Let's just say twice as massive. The mass of A is two times the mass of B. What is luminosity of A in terms of B? Let's see. So which one's the bigger star, A or B? Mass of A is twice that of B. So A must be the bigger star. So let's just have a think here. The bigger stars tend to be over here. So I'm thinking that the luminosity of A, the bigger star, is going to be maybe a little higher. I think A is going to have more luminosity. Let's test it out. I'm going to use this ratio down here. I'm going to say the luminosity of A over the mass of A to 3.5 equals luminosity of B over mass of B to the 3.5th power. Now here's where I do some substitution. You see the mass of A equals two times the mass of B, and I'm gonna plug that in. So luminosity of A over two times mass of B, all that to the 3.5th power, equals luminosity of B over mass of B to the 3.5th power. Now again, I'm solving for what is the luminosity. So let's rearrange. Luminosity of A equals luminosity of B times two times mass of B to the 3.5th power over mass of B to the 3.5th power. Now you gotta be careful. You can't just say, oh, that's gonna be two. Two times the mass of B. No, I need to take two and I need to take this exponent out here and distribute it. So. If I do that, let's see here, let's uh, do a little calculation. So if I do 2 raised to the 3 point, oops, sorry, 2 raised to the 3.5th power is 11.3. So that's going to be luminosity of B multiplied by 11.3 mass of B to the 3.5th over mass of B to the 3.5th. Well, mass of B to the 3.5th seems to cancel out just fine. And the final answer for this problem is that the luminosity of A is 11.3 times more luminous than the luminosity of B. This is a, this is a very typical problem whoops, using the mass-luminosity relationship. Uh, you could do it the other way. So maybe you saw two stars. Let's say they gave you X and why um, and they ask you to find hey how much bigger how much more massive is x compared to y well maybe you could figure out the luminosities from this graph and plug those in cancel stuff out and you should make it work out so uh, this is the mass luminosity relationship for main sequence stars and the hertzsprung russell diagram it's a lot of stuff here uh, certainly, um, but uh, I do want you to try the worksheet that is attached to this week where it, it'll show you what types of problems you're going to ask. I can't cover everything. If you have questions on this, please bring them to the, our Zoom meeting that we're going to have this week, and we'll uh, figure them out for you.
So uh, thank y'all. I uh, hope you have a great day, and I uh, will uh, see you later.